now we move on to a very important question. Where is Thurrock? Uh, so, I did wonder, but I have looked on Google Maps. Uh, so, it's going to be a really interesting presentation, I hope, on the importance of planning and designing locally distinctive places. And it's going to focus on the development of a strong working relationship between our local authority, in this instance, Thurrock Council, and architectural practice, Bell Phillips. And we have two very fine representatives here today. We've got Kirsty Poole, Principal Planner from Thurrock Council, and Jamie Campbell, Associate at Bell Phillips Architects. Uh, Kirsty has qualified um, through Sheffield Hallam in planning and has worked with local authority policy for over 10 years now. Uh, during that time, she's worked with three local authorities, most recently Thurrock, but I believe you're moving on to yes. greater things in Camden. Not necessarily greater, different. Oh, diff okay. <laughs> uh, Thurrock hat on today. So. Thurrock hat today, so that's good. <laughs> uh, Jamie has worked on the design and delivery of affordable housing projects for most of his career. Uh, it's taken many projects from inception through to completion, including the RIBA regional and national award winning Bruins Court development in Thurrock. And you've overseen the delivery of larger affordable housing projects across uh, across uh, the southeast, including the Echoes in Grace, which won the 2017 RIBA East Award, as well as numerous other projects. So I'll hand over to you. This is um, very much a presentation of, of, of two halves, so much so that there's actually two separate documents, so we all need a, a changeover quickly when my slides are finished. Um, I'm going to be concentrating on sort of looking at it from a local authority perspective, um, in terms of policy development, and then Jamie's going to be looking through some case studies with you. So, actually, just, just so you're aware, the question mark shown on, on the screen is, is not in Thurrock, in, in case you thought that that was in Thurrock, it's not, it's actually in Ipswich. Um, so, so where is Thurrock? And the whole reason for actually doing the presentation like this developed with the fact that in between um, being asked to do this presentation and actually writing the presentation, I've accepted a new position in Camden. Um, and all my friends and family were really excited. And they weren't excited because it was a promotion, because actually half of them believe that I'm doing party planning, not town planning, and don't really necessarily still understand the concept of what I do as a day job. But they were really excited because they knew where Camden was. And I've spent years trying to explain to people where Thurrock is, what it's about, and even my husband was, was really excited. He's like, yeah, Camden, lots of interesting, lots of exciting, lots of new things, lots of investment. And I personally have always found Thurrock that exciting. It's just the rest of the world hasn't cottoned on yet. Um, so Camden itself, everyone knows Camden as a place. It's got this sort of like vibrant atmosphere. It's really sort of evolving and innovative in terms of its architecture. It's been doing a lot of things as well in terms of transitional spaces. This here is a, um, a skip cafe that is near um, King's Cross. So at the moment, that's it's a temporary piece that's there. It's sort of a, a pop-up restaurant. Um, lots of stuff happening, lots of exciting things happening, compared with Thurrock. Um, Thurrock as a place um, can feel, when you're on the ground, slightly forgotten about. It can feel a bit done to, and I know certainly the people there are very concerned about how the area has urbanised um, over the last few years. And there's a lot of stuff as well around sort of like standardised housing. So if you want to see a 1930s house, come to Thurrock, I'll show you a 1930s house. I'll show you a typical 1950s house. I will show you some typical standardised housing in terms of Barrett's. I'll show you a Windsor um, typology from Persimmon. I can show you all this stuff, but you don't really get a feel on the ground of, of where Thurrock is or an appreciation of the type of place it is. Now, there'll be some people in this room that'll be rolling their eyes thinking, how can I compare Camden with Thurrock? Completely different places. Where I worked previously, Great Yarmouth, still had individual individuality, the opportunity there to create something, to create environments that excite people. In Great Yarmouth, in, in Norfolk, you've got Dutch gables, you've got flintwork buildings, but you've got a real appreciation there of the context as well in terms of how the settlement is laid out and planned for, and that's represented in terms of new developments that are happening as well, and some of the new stuff now that's happening around the um, town centre regeneration and trying to find those linkages between the river and the seafront and get a real appreciation for its coastal setting. So Thurrock, in case you didn't know where Thurrock was, Thurrock is in South Essex, it's uh, to the east of London, um, it's not London, although it's sort of on the border of it, um, there are places within Thurrock, in 
Purfleet, which is this sort of area here, where you can get to London in 25, 30 minutes on the train. We've got three international ports, a sub-regional shopping centre, and a housing need of about 32,000 over the next 20 years. So a very, very exciting place to work. So when people tell me Camden's exciting, Thurrock is equally as exciting and equally as important in terms of national development. Key characteristics, what makes up Thurrock as a place? The river. And it seems obvious, but actually you can get lost in that. You can be in the centre of one of our, our three riverside towns and not even see the river. Um, it presents a lot of opportunities, but also presents challenges um, with regards to nature conservation, its role as blue infrastructure, um, but also looking at things like tidal flooding. It impacts some of the ways that, that we would design and shape our communities as a result of the river. Um, and also is a big hub for industry. So again, I mentioned before, we've got three international ports in Thurrock. We've got Tilbury Port, which you'll all be familiar with, and a nationally significant infrastructure project that's currently being assessed at Tilbury 2. Um, we've got London Gateway, which is basically the, the last place where you get the really big container ships in. And we've got a heritage that's based around industry as well. When you look at things like the, um, the Barter buildings, so this was the, the Barter factory in East Tilbury, which was almost felt like a model town, Eastern European Art Deco principles, had some new development, infill development happen in and around the edge of that, potentially that location to grow it further in a way of respecting the industrial heritage that lies there and really getting that appreciation for what the original principles were. Lakeside. Lakeside is a beast. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Lakeside. It is insane. I went there and I thought, oh, it's just a shopping mall. And then I looked out and I was like, no, there's about three or four or five or six retail parks built around it. It's huge, completely car dominated, um, not a very friendly environment if you're walking around. And yet the old regional spatial strategy said that Lakeside should be a town centre. So we're now actually thinking, OK, we've got a couple of residential permissions in and around Lakeside. How do we really embrace that concept and create a, a new modern community in and around that setting? Kind of like we would look at sort of in terms of diversifying town centres, but on a much bigger scale. Busy urban towns. We've got quite a few, I mean, not to the extent, obviously, of like central London, Camden busy, but, but busy enough for an Essex setting. Um, good transportation connections, east-west in terms of C2C line, um, very vibrant centres, although there is more that can still be done, um, and denser sort of environments. So we've still got some tower blocks, we've got some mid-rise buildings, um, a lot of activity. In terms of the population, it's changed a lot recently. It's a very young population, it's very diverse. Um, becoming increasingly diverse as we see people migrating from East London outwards. Um, but that is something that's, that's bringing a new sense of life to it in terms of some of the shopping offers now are becoming a bit more um, varied. We've got a really strong local centre in Greys in terms of um, non-national retailer, lots of local independent shops, maybe not the highest quality of shopping, but it's there and it's vibrant and it's happening. And there is, you know, they're filling up the empty units and taking over the space. Suburban living. A lot of residential areas, um, residential in the traditional sense, like I said before, show you in 1930s, show you 1950s, but more recently we've really started to look at how the environments can change and be shaped in a more positive direction, and, and Jamie will tell you a lot more about that sort of suburban um, reimagination later on in his case studies. Peaceful rural villages, 70% of the borough is Greenbelt at the moment. We have a lot of um, what I would define as being sort of quite twee, quite, quite pretty um, villages to the north, reminiscent of the sort of like Essex Design Guide first time round, when you look at sort of the old buildings. Of course, the reimagination of it is, is very much more different than that, but that kind of sort of what you would expect Essex to look like and give it a flavour flavor and a feel. The challenge as we move forward um, I mentioned around 32,000 new homes, but there's more stuff in terms of reducing inequalities and creating more balanced communities. There are some areas that have real sort of like pockets of deprivation. And we want to try and make sure that our centres, although that they're vibrant, we need to try and create more of a sustained economy, something that's sort of more longer term. And also as well, there are places where people can feel sort of unsafe late at night because we haven't got that shoulder economy. And it's trying to look at how we can sort of create that moving forward. In terms of the development plan, what we're hoping to do is, is a brand new local plan, which would be um, supported by South Essex Joint Strategic Plan, which is something now that we're working on across the authorities. Um, but the real thing I want to talk about was the design guide. 
because I can talk about Thurrock as a place and I can talk about the opportunities and the challenges that exist there and I can talk about what I want to happen. But the truth is, I don't build things. I create conditions. And that's what we have to do in policy. We have to look at what the evidence, the needs are, and try and create the conditions that will make that environment thrive. And, and will really sort of respect the heart of a place, but then bring it forward. Because there's lots of places within Thurrock that don't have that real sort of like that real character that real feel to them that don't embrace the place enough and and that's simply not good enough people deserve better so we need to try through planning to find a way to raise those aspirations to raise the design quality but at the same time be respectful of what people's wants and needs are and try not to push them to a point where they feel uncomfortable about it there's a lot of people that would say you know we don't want to be london but yet I've got sort of young people that I'm talking to at events that would appreciate a more modern, more urban context. So it's finding that balance. So at the moment, we've got a design guide. We adopted that in 2017. Um, and that's been supported by a, a residential alterations and extensions SPD, which is actually a very innovative document, which I've not brought with me today, but I would have a look on our website. Um, and it's funny, actually, because when you think about homeowners' extensions and alterations, in their singularity, they make a very limited impact on the street scene. But actually, when you start looking at people that have done inappropriate dormers, dodgy side extensions, they've created a terracing feel, it can really affect a place, all those little incremental changes. So having some principles for that has been really useful in terms of trying to make sure that we're taking design quality all the way from, from the very bottom to the very top. Um, so our design guide, um, and I'm going to try my hardest not to swear because I normally use a swear word when describing this, but the concepts are, are very, very simple. That they're not revolutionary, they are not things that you haven't heard before, it's about planning for places and planning for places in, by understanding the context <coughs> of the place, appreciating the strategic and local setting, working within a landscape framework and the character of the surrounding areas, working with existing site features, um, heritage assets, um, open spaces, um, buildings, trees, making connections, finding out where people want to go and then also working with them um, and building in sustainability. None of this is new. None of this is, is stuff that is revolutionary. None of this stuff is, is you know, exciting enough to say it's groundbreaking, it's new ground, it's not, it's been there all along. It's just about us translating it in terms of what this means in Thurrock and showing case studies for, for how those sort of principles could be applied in a local context. Um, and also trying to look at the language of the document and make sure it's understandable for communities as well. Because when we were talking, earlier, asking that question around whether or not you could refuse things on design grounds, communities need to be aware of what is and what isn't a material consideration. And if they have concerns that the design quality isn't there, they can use a document like this, which is understandable, pick points out, and then put that in their representations. And that's one of the pieces of work that I'm doing with our local plan forum, is um, getting residents to understand what is and what is not material and to work with them so that they can not just support developments in the right way, but also challenge them as well. Um, Thurrock is a very diverse place, as we've seen by that whistle stop sides flu. So what our, our design guide also does is it focuses in on place typologies. So it says that the types of principles that we would use in urban centres and transport hubs are a little bit different from those that we would do in purely residential neighbourhoods. Um, Thurrock and Lakeside has its own character, its own flavour, its own feel, and the types of applications that come forward in that may look slightly differently. Same with areas that are adjacent to big commerce and industry. And it's about having those principles in place, but not being stifling and trying to find that balance as we move forward. So other planning tools, as well as the design guide, there's other things that, that we can do as local authority planners. Planning performance agreements are a great thing. Um, Pre-application discussions as well. But the most important thing is having multidisciplinary teams and being able to draw people in with different skill sets. So it's bringing in people that have got landscape mm -hmm. um, abilities, design abilities, um, heritage, but also transportation, education, health, um, looking at people with our social care team as well when you're looking in terms of housing provision moving forward and having one voice as an authority. So partnership working for us is very much about having that, that singular voice and getting people internally and externally to buy into that vision. Um, Cave Design Review panel that we have at the moment as well. Um, 
And in terms of our assessment of emerging plan process policies, we're doing that as part of an integrated assessment. So we're building in the health impact work from the start because healthy places are normally well-designed places. We have um, developer and agent forums so we can make sure that we're taking the market on board. Um, and we have those as ways that they can check and challenge <coughs> things that we're doing. Um, so we can have those conversations early on, especially when we're developing things like policy evidence. Um, and we have training and work shadowing opportunities for staff. Um, talking again about non-traditional routes into becoming a planner, a lot of people that we have in our planning admin team get the bug early on. And we're trying to find ways then that they can become planners, they could become urban designers or conservation specialists and working with them to make sure they get that kind of experience. Partnership working. So basically the, the whole point of this is we need to be working together, we need to be working in a collaborative way. So we have lots of internal partners and stakeholders and it's about having that buy in that conversation. We have conversations with developers, site promoters, statutory consultees, key stakeholders and local communities. And there's a, there's a couple of things that, that we would do with all of, in all of those situations, same thing. Conversations need to be open, honest and transparent. People need to realise what they can and what they can't shape. And we need to be clear and concise in the messages that we're putting out there. Um, and partnership working is that it's about a to and a fro so we can't go into those assuming that we have all the answers we need to go into it with a willingness to see schemes and things develop and change as a result of the conversations we're going to have because if we're not willing to see them change or develop then we shouldn't be having that conversation with people we shouldn't be misleading them and telling them they've got a say or an influence when they haven't um, the board that you can see behind you so these are from a series of community consultation events we did earlier this year, which were called the, the Your Voice, Your Place events. And these are vision boards that the communities created in terms of what they felt the biggest issues were, what their kind of direction moving forward. If they were in charge of their place, what would they want to see it change into? And it was done in the style of visual minutes because I could take a load of survey responses. I could do a lot of graphs, charts, put them available on the website, and none of them would be as powerful as a community looking at that and seeing that <laughs> develop as the day went on. Um, we're about to launch a, a new series of events now to support our local plan stage two consultation over the summer. It won't be that kind of activity, but again, it's lots of things based on sort of planning for real type um, methods. So very interactive, very collaborative, um, trying to almost get people to consult and have a say in planning without realising they are. Because if you tell them it's a planning consultation, lots of people won't turn up. If you tell them it's a community fun day and while we're there, we're finding out what types of housing you like or what you think needs to be improved in your town centre, people will turn up. It's amazing um, how much, you know, difference. So if I talk about like the first consultation I did, which was purely local plan based, um, I went to one location, I had two people turn up. I ran this style event, I had 73 people turn up. Okay, the numbers still aren't there, but if I tell you I had 73 people turn up and it was in the middle of the snowstorm, you will see the fact that hopefully my summer events should be much more better attended. Um, and, and yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it really. So I'm going to pass on to, to Jamie and then I think we're taking questions afterwards. Um, well, firstly, thank you to Kirsty uh, for that. I've actually really enjoyed working with Kirsty, putting this presentation together because I get to see what Kirsty looks at on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, and what we've been trying to do is put some of that into action. Um, thank you also to the RIBA East and the RTPI uh, really enjoy kind of coming along and hopefully now we all kind of have a bit more of an understanding geographically uh, and aspirationally uh, where Thurrock is. Um, my name is Jamie Campbell, I'm associate at Bell Phillips Architects. I've been working a lot in Thurrock, uh, bringing forward uh, our projects there um, over the last six years or so and that's what we're going to talk about, some case studies. Uh, we've got uh, three different types of context to look at and as uh, Kirsty was talking about, kind of quite challenging all within the same borough. Uh, we've got an urban context, a suburban context, an infill context, and fortunately all of these have been included in the Thurrock Design Guide, and hopefully as we go through, we can sort of understand why that might be. Um, they're all 100% affordable as well, which is worth bearing in mind. Um, there's a lot of talk about 50% affordable in London, 35% affordable, viability assessments, a lot of that. This is the housing enabling team in Thurrock pushing 100% affordable developments in their local area so just have that in your mind and then I'd like to finish on the importance of collaboration because hopefully you'll see as we go through uh, 
the importance of this. So, our work in Thurrock. Um, here's a couple of our lovely residents. Uh, so we've got uh, this guy here. This is Mike. He is a former paratrooper. His knees are not what they used to be. He moved into our uh, Bruns Court development close to the town centre in, in South Offenden, so it didn't have to go too far to get to the town centre. So we were appointed by Thurrock uh, to carry out feasibility studies on a number of garage sites, disused, disused kind of urban sites, kind of standard stuff. But what we had was we had a really forward-thinking client. We had a brief for exemplar housing, uh, raising aspirations uh, of, of people, but also developers in the area to see that this is the local authority bringing forward these housing, uh, this housing. Engaging with communities, I think that's been talked about a lot today, which I've really enjoyed hearing about because that's something we feel very strongly about as a practice. Um, empowering residents, instilling a sense of ownership over the places that they live in. Again, that's something we all have a hand in. Um, the client identified a need, so people being hammered by the bedroom tax, particularly over 55s, or families, single parents with children, children growing up and moving out, and not wanting to leave the communities that they're in, so the provision of alternative accommodation that is of a high quality for people who are in a genuine need. And challenging perceptions on social housing, so that's something as a practice we like to do. We like to think that people look at our projects and go, well, is that social housing? We talked about tenure blind, you know, actually, you look at this and say, if this is what social housing is in Thurrock, uh, and the local authority are bringing this housing forward, this is our, this is our response to uh, kind of house builders to rise to the challenge. Um, so our first uh, case study is the Echoes. Um, I did have a pointer, but I'm just not going to touch it. Um, we've got the train, main train line running through here, the main train station is here. We've got South Essex College, kind of the campus bit here, the main Thurrock civic offices here, and this is the Seabrook Rise estate, we've got some power blocks here, and this main estate park here in the top part. It was a derelict garage uh, with a community facility in a porter cabin sitting inside a multi-use games area. So they'd, it, was, it, was, it was all sorts of um, wrong and challenges. And this is our urban context, uh, and so Community House with a, with a charity uh, working in the area. We immediately engaged with the community, so we, we understood that, that was really important. Um, these guys uh, are going to be looking at this building for a lot longer than I am, because uh, they live right opposite it, and it's part of what they do and where they live. So we wanted it to, uh, uh, we wanted to engage with them, and also with Community House, because they were a charity working specifically in the Seabrook Rise estate. Uh, so Again, what we ended up with was the community house, the new community house building here, which is a kind of town-facing project. This is the main railway line, Fenchurch Street, out to South End, but also to Tilbury Docks. So you get a lot of freight running along there. We created a two-sided street uh, with the existing buildings on the on the south here, and it's basically three blocks broken up around a north-facing courtyard garden. And the main entrance to these two blocks is from the courtyard. So you enter into the courtyard and then into the building. So actually what that does is it creates opportunities for you to meet your neighbours, for example. It's a sort of subtle uh, way of, of forming a community or trying to, trying to introduce a community to the area. So this is what it looks like. Um, again, interaction with the community was fundamental on this project. Um, it's a fairly simple construction, kind of straight up and down. Uh, brickwork with a dynamic roof form, which was a response to rights of light and daylight and sunlight. Uh, to the opposing buildings, um, so we kind of went up where we didn't have anything opposite and we went down where we had something opposite. Uh, but also we got these kind of jewels of balconies and the balconies look over the Thames, it's really important to sort of have that sort of facing aspect which is really nice. Um, and we wanted it to have a bit of a presence in the town, it's kind of visible from the civic offices and again it's, it's that strong sense of identity uh, for the area but this development specifically. Um, so here we are, this is Community House. So again, this is a facility now available for, uh, the charity has moved into this, they put on events, they run uh, coffee mornings, they have their own cake making uh, company that they make cakes for events, and it's a, it was really, really quite, um, quite exciting to work yeah, with, with these guys as well, bringing this particular building forward, which wasn't actually part of the original brief, the original brief was for housing, and we ended up building a community centre as well, which I thought was really <laughs> exciting. Um, so, again, our lovely residents, the lady on the left here now works with Community House uh, making cakes, so she makes cakes in her flat, 
and she uh, she takes them over to community house, and then they have their coffee mornings. Um, and she said she she used to live in one of the tower blocks. She said she never thought in her wildest dreams she would live in a place like this, which I thought was really nice. Uh, she had teenagers who'd gone off to uh, university. She was really struggling in the tower blocks, a sort of three bed flat, getting hit by bedroom tax. So, uh, moving on, St Chad's. This is our suburban uh, context. So Tilbury Docks here. Main railway station just there, the main sort of high street uh, for Tilbury here, and then St Chad's Road goes up to a former school site in St Chad's there. Um, again, quite a challenging site. Uh, it's uh, in a flood risk area uh, from the Thames. Um, and actually, we again engaged immediately with the local community, and what became very clear was people who live in Tilbury really passionate and proud to live in Tilbury. And we wanted to really tap into that and also to talk to people and make them understand that this isn't just something that's being forced upon them. This is an extension of their community. This isn't necessarily uh, a, a kind of noddy estate that's being built on the outside, outskirts of town. Um, so we standardised roof, uh, sorry, standardised plot types. Let's have a little look. This is a, this is a plan for the site, so we've sort of changed the orientation. But Tilbury Docks has these huge cranes, which uh, Kirsty showed in her previous... Um, slides and what we ended up with was the viewing corridors down to these cranes and this is a linear park here to help deal with some of the flooding on the site um, and the site layout evolved um, to, to be something that was in and of Tilbury and again this came from the consultation aspect that we worked uh, with the local community um, we standardized plot types but then we popped up into the roof to give it an extra bedroom uh, so again, it was kind of trying to keep costs as low as possible, uh, which is a very low value area, um, but still do something that's exciting um, and that, you know, had its own sense of identity, but still uh, kind of respecting the character of the area by having these connections with the port. Um, and I really like this, this slide because this is the linear park, which is also a swale, which is a flood risk mitigation uh, measure. Um, and it just provides some uh, amenity, which is, is kind of really exciting. And um, yeah, so still within this context, you get those views towards the cranes. The next project, uh, brace it close, this is our infill project. I kind of explained the site, but it's basically a really big housing estate uh, in Corringham. There's a, a kind of a Morrison's here with a village hall here. This is a school, and then the rest of it is quite a sprawling housing estate quite far away from the main train station, it's kind of way over in that direction, and suffers uh, kind of from a lack of infrastructure, which is something that's been mentioned a lot today. Um, disused garage site sloping from the south to the north, uh, and our response was to challenge what was there already. Uh, so what you can see from the lower parts here, we've got, is this your front garden, is this your back garden? There's these little lanes and rabbit runs of uh, kind of high fences, really not a particularly nice uh, typology. And then we've got a pinwheel typology at the top there, which I'd never seen before. And basically you've just got a front garden. And so everyone puts up a 1.8 metre high fence for privacy. And then uh, there's nothing to your urban realm and you just end up with these little corridors. It's really not very nice. So we wanted to face outwards uh, to create a street. We wanted to face inwards to create some private amenity, somewhere your children can play safely, uh, because all of this was going to be family accommodation. So there's 12 houses on this one here. Um, and yeah, so we've got, uh, this is, so this is very close. So these are three beds um, here. When the top floor terrace has a view out to the, no uh, the neighbouring sort of landscape, which is really nice. And all of the dwellings have access onto a private courtyard here which then gives on to a planted, uh, planted border and then kind of stepping stones across to a central courtyard area, uh, which is shared amenity with the 12 uh, and completely secure as well, only accessible through the, through the dwelling. And because of the sloping site, the three beds all had a, a, a light well um, to get light deep into the plan um, on the sort of southern edge, uh, which is actually really difficult to photograph. And that's probably the best example of a photograph. Um, so, as our double height space and the courtyard, which uh, um, also, by the way, people do actually live here now. <laughs> it's a classic architect's example of kind of no people in the photograph. And I've got another slide that hopefully uh, challenges that a little bit. So we took the AJ judges around uh, last year, um, and I really like this 
on the left, signs of life, uh, and then uh, obviously well used. I've got children myself. The amount of paraphernalia that come with children is just incredible. Uh, and I love seeing this. I love seeing this because this is, this is people bringing the place to life. This is what we designed and people have now, it's not ours anymore, it's theirs, and they are doing what they want with it. Oh, I think that's fantastic. Um, so this slide here, uh, this is my final slide. So the importance of collaboration, why what we do actually matters. Um, in the grand scheme of things, what we do matters and what we create uh, will be with the communities we work with long before, long after we've left. Um, and hopefully uh, it's really important to discuss that with them. Um, it's people that bring these designs to life uh, and some examples of what happened when architects leave. So top left, that's the Bruns Court cycle store, a uh, big old area at ground floor. It's used as a garden store for the garden working parties, communal gardens. They store all their stuff in there, no bikes, don't you see. Um, and uh, this one here, so they formed a residence and tenants association, applied for funding from the council to get kettles and kitchen equipment, some nice chairs, so that they could use their garden room. Um, the top one there is bracelet close, another photograph of you know kids stuff hanging around. Seabrook Rise, uh, sorry, uh, the Echoes at Seabrook Rise as it was. Um, the gardens maturing at, sea, uh, at the Echoes, which is really fantastic because people actually sit there and they talk to their neighbours and they go out there and have barbecues and it's kind of being used. These guys, top right, that's St Chad's, they'll, they'll cycle around and smash a few windows and do what kids do. Um, that's actually what they do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then this is the garden room at Brim's Court. Uh, I didn't show you Brim's Court today because I thought we show some different examples of what we've been doing but this gives out onto a big communal garden and again that's kind of those ideas of community um, and people living their lives in the spaces and homes and places that we have created and when I say we I don't just mean Bell Phillips um, I really strongly believe architecture doesn't just exist on its own it's part of a much wider process um, and kind of everyone in the room has a, has a part to play in that um, so on these projects, we had a forward-thinking client. We had planning policy uh, framework that allowed for developments like this to be brought forward. Um, a planning team who were properly resourced, uh, which I think is we're seeing improvements on now. Um, planning, uh, sorry, housing and regen team who were well briefed and a desire to push forward uh, a strong design agenda um, and a genuine engagement with the local community. I think that's those are the sort of fundamentals. Um, and for me personally, it's been deeply humbling uh, as an architect to be part of this process and to speak to the people that actually live in the, the developments that we have created. Um, and yeah, they're actually now living their lives there, um, which I think is fantastic. So as a final thought, uh, why is collaboration important? Because what we do matters. Fantastic, I have to say. Um, having, I've actually walked around the Echoes uh, a couple of months ago and I, it struck me as a really successful piece of urban realm. Uh, what struck me though was the different, difference in density uh, of that scheme, in, in particular relating to some of the other areas of the suburb around. So how, how as an authority, do you approach the, the issue of density? We talked about it earlier with you know, urban developments appearing in, in village contexts but also within the, the sort of city centres or town centres. What's your attitude towards densification? I, I think it's not always just looking at it as, as density for density's sake. So if you look at our housing needs work, we do have a greater need for smaller properties. But two, three bed townhouses that are more affordable to local people on local salaries, they can't afford four bed detached properties and all the rest of it. But also when you're considering some of the schemes that have come forward that are 100% affordable housing, issues like the bedroom tax and stuff like that means that actually there was a need for us to start looking at smaller units in some places. When I say smaller, I mean number of bedrooms smaller, not space on the smaller. Um, but I think it's just about being having that appreciation and that understanding in terms of matching needs with the types of buildings that are coming. And sometimes that does lead to densification. In other places, in Thurrock, it wouldn't be necessarily appropriate to have done that. And the needs would be very different. 
they will be maybe for sort of more more spacious settings or properties. So it's having that diversification, I suppose, across the wider borough. Yeah, I think I think um, Jennifer spoke about it earlier, which was context, character, connectivity, and community. I think those are the those are the key responses that we need to have when we're looking at, uh, at different areas within a borough. So as I say, you've got Greenbelt, you've got Town Centre, you've got kind of the craziness um, of the, the sort of out-of-town shopping centres. It, it's, there's a lot to, to deal with and it's about being sensitive to where it is that you're proposing your development and tailoring it to that. Grays is a town centre, it's a very urban uh, area, so the densities can be higher uh, and it can support that in terms of its infrastructure. St Chad's, which was our project, was very suburban and if we'd gone higher on the density there, we would have struggled because it's not as well connected as Grace. So it's, yeah, I think it's about um, kind of understanding the context. Oh, Question down the front. No, I've probably got time for two. So. Hi, it was a, a sort of two-pronged question, I guess. Um, in terms of the development that you've done, you said that the hope was that, given that was 100% um, affordable, that it would raise the bar for other developers. And I was just wondering what impact you'd seen in relation to that um, and what impact you'd seen at the local planning authority level when you talked about ability to refuse design of poor quality, whether this has helped you in that approach. Um, I, I think... The, the, the fact that, that we are delivering what we preach is a very strong message to the market and we have done some work quite recently with our developer forum which consists of about 35 to 40 different individuals in terms of site promoters, developers, house builders. We did some work with them specifically looking at healthy communities as part of their TCPA's work that they were doing. So we did a whole session on that with them so that they are aware <coughs> of the fact that we've got new standards, that we're working towards higher standards. And certainly now as we start looking from a policy context in terms of sites that we're going to be releasing, potentially from the Greenbelt in the future maybe, they are aware that they need to do better and that we need to be looking at transformational change within places and not just focusing in on, oh, well, that's the thing you've always approved. Oh, this has always worked here. It's trying to get people to, to push themselves. And it's not always through architectural styles. I mean, Belfort Lipstock is, is fantastic. Sometimes it's the small wins. It's about getting a, a better layout with improved connectivity to the surrounding areas rather than getting an inward-looking housing estate. And I think we are seeing developers and site promoters more actively engaging with us in terms of design, especially because our previous urban designer was very good at adding in the extra five units for them because she found a better layout. That seemed to go down very, very well with site promoters and developers. So they, they were willing to sort of amend things around then as well. So... We've got time for one more question. Uh, thank you. It's just a clarification, really. Um, I like the way you um, engage. <laughs> and I think I would like to talk to you a bit more about that, yeah. sort of yeah. offline. Um, you said it, it, the sites are 100% affordable. Now, is, uh, was the site, or are the sites owned by your local authority? Or is it a JV? Or how? Do you end up bringing up sites that are 100% so affordable? It was 100% owned by Thurrock Council, who is a housing and regen team, uh, and they were. Uh, it was these sites were parts of their bid for central government funding. So that was it, this is completely driven by the local authority, uh, owned and now managed by the local authority as well. So I think it's a real. Um, it's not talking about handing over to a housing association. It's not talking about having a an Almo. This is this is. Thurrock Council upping their game, investing in their building stock, uh, and and also, um, yeah, investing in affordable housing, which I think is fantastic. And I, I would applaud. Great. Okay. Thank you both very Thank much. You, I'm sure that we. Thank you, Preston.